They sing good songs. Good. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3 with me tonight. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. First, Second Thessalonians, some of the earliest scripture ever written in the New Testament. There seems to be a considerable consensus that these are the early writings of the Apostle Paul that even predates Matthew, Mark, Luke, and certainly John. Second Thessalonians chapter number 3 and verse number 15. Yet count him not as an enemy but admonish him as a brother. Father, I pray that you'd bless your word now as it goes forth. Anoint it, Lord. I pray, Father, it's the good seed, Lord. We've got good seed. May it find good ground. And then in due time, bring forth fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 11 says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. The Apostle Paul was pretty strong on people that didn't want to work because he said, if you don't work, you don't eat. And have him run the government today. That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? <laughs> Verse number 12. Now, them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Now watch the context of what we're reading here. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So he is a disobedient brother, but he's still a brother. In plainer words, Christians should be able to observe one another in the sense that they see if an individual is living the way they should. You don't have to know everything about a person's personal life. Uh, that's, uh, that's up to God to judge that, judge the motive of the heart. But if it's a blatant thing and it's open, you know, and, they're, and they are, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, they're, they're arrogant in it, in your face with it. Then a Christian should say, hold on, now there's a problem here something going on here. It's not right. It's not good. And the scripture says to admonish that one, you know. Uh, this is to be done long before you have to restore such an one. The book of Galatians chapter 6, he said, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one, the spirit of meekness, considering thyself also. So it is definitely incumbent upon Christians to, to be conscious of uh, the kind of lives that people are living around them and to... Uh, you know, to, to understand that the Holy Spirit is only going to allow someone to live a certain way, a certain time. And if you're really born again, he will intervene. And if he does not intervene and you just continue on in a lifestyle that's in rebellion to God, you can be certain you're not saved. And that's a fact. So, but I want you to notice that even though a person may fall out of favor with God, they may become backslidden. They may, uh, you know, they may, they may even bring reproach on the name of Christ. All of these things can happen. The Apostle Paul says, still do not count them as an enemy. Now that's drawing a line, you see. There's a difference between an enemy and a brother. I mean, it's on the surface of it. That's what it says. Don't count him as an enemy. In other words, we're not talking about Satan here. Satan is the one who sows tares among the wheat. He certainly is an enemy. You know the parable, the enemy hath done this. Certainly, Satan is the enemy. He's the enemy of God. He's the enemy of man. He's the enemy of the church of God. He's an enemy in every sense of the word. But we're talking here about a human being. And it's important to understand the principle. A lot of people say, well, you know, uh, we love the sinner and hate the sin. I agree with that. But they go so far sometimes as to say, well, he's just a person. He's just a human being. He's not our enemy. Oh, yes, he can be your enemy. Yes, he can. The Apostle Paul said, Alexander the coppersmith hath done me much wrong. God reward him accordingly. 
He even, the Apostle Paul even prayed for those who had forsaken him while he was in the ministry there and left him. He said, God, don't hold it to their account. But when it came to Alexander the coppersmith, who actively opposed the preaching of the gospel and the ministry of the apostle, he said, God, reward him accordingly. He counted him as an enemy. You need to understand, folks, that this country is divided. There is no question about it. It didn't get here overnight, and it won't get out of this overnight. I don't know if it will ever get out of it. But we definitely live in a nation, folks, where a lot of the people you're rubbing shoulders with every day of your life are enemies of the gospel of Christ. And you need to understand that. They're not the loyal opposition. That term's long since passed. People have uh, fortified their positions and taken their positions. And uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a group in this country who, who are bloodthirsty to kill babies. There's a group of women this coming uh, day after the inaugura inauguration. Uh, I don't know how many. You know, I have no idea how many is going to show up. They say a million woman march. And they are progressive liberals, and they are marching f with a pro-choice uh, platform. In other words, we kill babies. One group of women who, wanted, who had been accepted to march with them uh, was a pro-life group. But these, these women didn't know that until just apparently recently they found out they were pro-life. And so they told them, well, you're not going to march with us. So much for the women's movement. You understand what that's saying? That's saying you either kill babies or you're not part of our movement and our organization. Well, I'm not part of it. <coughs> I can't imagine tonight the accountability before God for innocent blood that's been shed. Proverbs says these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination to him, and one of them is hands that shed innocent blood. I don't know if anything in this nation could be more innocent than the blood of a little unborn child, just as innocent as it can be. Nothing. Everybody ought to see this. It was on uh, CBN. This lady, she was aborting the faces of, uh, and this uh, this woman started raising and Satan, and she had a witness that she was not for lady. Every woman ought to look at that and listen to that woman precisely. I understand. There's, there's, no, there's no compassion in this issue of, abor of abortion, of killing the unborn. And the figure now runs somewhere between 60 to 70 million that have died in this nation at the hands of these butchers. And of course the argument is, well, what about rape? What about incest? This and that and so forth and so on, which is only a very small fraction of the abortions that are performed. Very small fraction. But it's the straw man that they always pull out and use as an argument against, uh, against the obvious. And the obvious is that somebody's got a lot of blood on their hands. This is a bloody country. And uh, they don't have to answer to me. They've got to answer to God. The churches in this town, full of people, full of people with reverends in their pulpits who are killers of babies. And they justify it in every kind of a name, every kind of a whatever you please. Well, mark me off of that crowd. I will publicly re de renounce, disown them. They are not my brothers and sisters. When you kill babies, you don't belong to the Christ that I belong to. I'm not a baby killer. But the reason I bring that up is because that's glaringly obvious to everyone. And the reason is because it's the killing of a, a little human being, a little child, innocent child. But the Bible says that we understand if we're, if we're mature in the faith... There's going to be people that come into your church and, and come around you that maybe have, may have been raised in an entirely different culture than yours. They may, uh, they may, not, uh, they may have a hard time with your language. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of different things happen to people. I've always said that when someone comes to Temple Baptist Church, as far as coming to this church is concerned, folks, they're welcome. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they're doing. They're welcome to come here. I've heard preachers, and I'm sure they're probably misguided, and they mean well, but... You know, I've heard them say, well, if you walk through that back door, you better be dressed a certain way. You'd better conduct yourself and deport yourself in a certain way and so forth and so on. Uh, there's a degree of that, but there's a limit to that too. I don't want someone to come in and disrupt the service, do you? 
No, I don't want that to happen. But where are they going to go to hear the gospel, folks? Where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? If they can't come in here and hear it, where are they going to go to hear it? And the Bible teaches us clearly that there is a difference between the natural man and the man that is saved, the spiritual man. You don't have to do much of a study, and you'll get in the New Testament, you'll find out that a carnal, the word carnal, uh, is, uh, is associated with the flesh. The fleshly mind and the fleshly desires and so forth. The word carnal. The word carnal is also attached to some Christians. Ye are carnal, he said. Talking about immature Christians or Christians who are loose in their faith or who don't want to who don't want to live a dedicated life to the Lord. He called them carnal. But the word carnal is not used that much in the New Testament in reference to unsaved people. The word natural is used in reference to unsaved people. You know why? Because a natural man has an absolute antipath antipath antipathy toward the spiritual. He doesn't understand it. He cannot comprehend it. He has no conscience of the fact that it exists. He has no way of knowing He's a natural man. He lives in a natural world and he judges everything by a natural mind. And there's no way in the world that you could have a dialogue with a man like that because he does not understand what you're talking about. And now, folks, here's the sad thing about that. This town is full of churches that have reverends in their pulpit that are completely natural. And the people in the, pulp and the, people in the pews are natural. They know nothing about Christ. Now, of course, they say, well, you're a religious bigot, you know. <laughs> Who are you to stand up there and judge me, blah, blah, blah. I'm not judging them. I'm letting the Word of God judge them. Now, that's glaringly obvious on the surface of it, too, because that's one of those things just like abortion. It's the kind of thing that slaps you in the face. You should be able to see it. That some of these churches, the only, they feel like their only motive in existence is social reform, doing good deeds and things of that nature. And there's certainly a lot of places that we could, a lot of areas where social reform would be good. And, and for you to do good, the Bible says you're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. These are all good things. But that's not the primary reason we're here. The primary reason we are here is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Lift up his name. That's why we exist and this gets, into the, this gets into the technical part of what I'm talking about tonight. It gets a little deeper into what's going on. Glaringly on the surface of it, slapping you in the face, abortion's wrong. Glaringly on the surface of it, to slap you in the face, you go to churches where, they, where you know these people don't know the Lord. But you can get a little deeper into this thing tonight and begin to understand what the apostle's talking about. And that is, there's a lot of people who think they're super spiritual. They really do. And they'll judge you according to that standard that they've developed in their super spiritual life. Now, let me tell you something tonight. I know Pentecostals that I love and that I consider to be my friend. And I know some Pentecostals that I think are some of the finest Christians on this earth. They are. They're good people. They give you the shirt off their back. They love the Lord. They love the Lord, and they, they live exemplary lives. And we could learn an awful lot from our Pentecostal brethren about a lot of things. No question about that. No question about it. But there are areas that we don't fully agree. And, and the reason, for the most part, that we don't do a lot of worshiping with, with, the, with, their, with these brethren is because of the fact that there are areas that we don't agree in, and they could become a point of strife or contention which would affect your worship Amen. it would affect your worship but on the other hand I want you to understand I've been, I've been at this a long time and I know an awful lot of Baptists that are going to go to hell and I know a lot of Pentecostals that are going to go to heaven now that's a fact that's a fact but the point is this and it's a very important point you can always tell what a man or a woman's got by who they talk about. That's the key. That's the acid test. I don't care if you're a Pentecostal, you're a Baptist, or what you are. If all you talk about is your experience, or if all you talk about is your church, or all you talk about is your preacher, 
or all you talk about is what you've accomplished, or all you talk about is where you've been and what you've done for the Lord, I have serious doubts that you have any concept at all of what the, of the power of the Holy Ghost is about. When the Holy Spirit comes into this world, he'll not speak of himself. He'll testify of Christ. The Apostle Paul said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You don't need me. You need the Lord. I don't need to be exalted. The Lord Jesus does. There's just something deep down inside my soul that says to me, I know me. <laughs> I know all about me. And yet as much as I know about me, God knows more about me than I know about myself. And I really don't care about exalting myself, blowing myself up. And, uh, but I do want the Lord Jesus Christ. I want his name. I want his spirit. I want all there is about him to be manifest and exalted and lifted up. I want that to become so important to the church of the living God. It's not so much what you say either. It's what you are and what you do. You'll notice that these songs that we have in our books, we've got two books here, and there are other books here, books here, books here, books here. Lord only knows how many songs have been written in Christianity. Some of those songs are very good songs because they exalt Christ. They're about the Lord Jesus. They're about what he did for us. They're about the glory of Christ. They're about who he is. They're about his coming again. They're about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost just does something. It's just amazing at what he does. We were standing under a little tent yesterday in a graveyard not far from here. A little graveyard. And the rain was pouring down. And I was doing a graveside service for Sue, uh, Sue Lee, her brother, who was a father to her. She loved him dearly. And he got sick and died within just a couple, just a few days. And he's gone. So here we are on a dreary day. The rain's pouring down. We're standing under this tent. And a few, a few people are gathered together there next to a casket. And I stand up and open the Bible. And I begin to read the scripture. Then I start talking. I didn't talk about me. I didn't talk about the weather. I didn't talk about the president. I didn't talk about the flag. I didn't talk about the country. I didn't talk about the movement. I didn't talk. I talked about the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and what he is to us. Yeah. And you know what happened there? All of a sudden, and they all felt it. Out of the clear blue, the power of the Holy Ghost moved right under that tent, came into that place, and it felt like a bolt of lightning that hit me. I knew at the moment that he had come, and I could sense it in them. They knew it too. You see what he did? He reached down from the land of light into the rain. He reached down from, down from the land of sorrow into this place. Reached down from the land of heaven into the land of sorrow. And he brought the power of God, which was the earnest of the spirit. It is that mark that he says, I know all about it. And I'm here, and I'm comforting you, and you understand by what I'm doing. This is the earnest of the Spirit. It is the guarantee that you know the Lord is the moving of the Holy Ghost inside your soul. And I can't tell you how the move of the Holy Spirit is for you, but I know what it is for me. And it's not something you can fake. You can put on all you want to. You can, you can push out and press and press into till you're blue in the face. But you will never work up the Holy Ghost. You can work up your emotions, but you'll not work up the Holy Spirit. You can be as quiet as a church mouse and the Holy Ghost come in sweetly and move in your soul and in your spirit and you know him. How many of you know the Holy Spirit tonight? Because you know what I'm talking about. There is a definite presence. And that is the earnest. That means that's the guarantee that we know the Lord. I said hallelujah to God. Because it was a hard time for her. Terribly hard time. Sitting on that front row. Bless her sweetheart. Bless her heart. Sitting there and lost this dear man. And just like that. I mean just a few weeks ago. Big strong strapping man. And now just like that. In no time he struck down. And he's gone from this earth. That's how insecure this present life is. That's how quickly 
It can come to an end. But God comes down in the Holy Spirit and says, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. You should have enough spiritual discernment to know when you're around a bunch of people that feel like that they got to do something, that they've got to work up the Spirit of God, that they've got to do something to get the power of God moving in that place. No, sir, my friend. No, sir. Haven't you ever been in a prayer meeting when you've been down on your face praying and you just, all of a sudden, you felt something moving from the corner? And it just kind of sweeps across the whole place. And everybody around you, they just, they just, they just, they just sense the life. Life just came in here. That's the Holy Ghost. And he only does that for saved people. The natural man will never know what the Holy Spirit is about. Never. Never. He'll never know it in his life. He'll never know. Because he has no capacity for that. Your spirit must be born of the Spirit of God in order for the Holy Spirit to energize What's inside you? And if that doesn't happen, it's never going to, you're, never going to, you're never going to have that sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So if a church will make Jesus first, Christ first, our Lord Jesus Christ first and foremost, if you lift him up and talk about him, pray to him, exalt him, you may be surprised at what a difference you're going to see in that place. If all you do when you go to a church house is hear men brag on men, and exalt men. Let me tell you what to, what's, going to, what's going to happen to you. You're going to become bitter. You're going to become disillusioned. You're going to become critical. Because you know just as well as I know, as well as everybody else knows, the best of men are at best just men. And the fundamental Baptist movement in some areas, not all of them, but in some areas, the fundamental Baptists are terrible about all you hear about is that man or these great men. Let me tell you something. There are no great men, but there is a great God that can take, <laughs> that can take the lowest sinner and lift him up. And you lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. There's not a man walking the face of this earth that would let you follow him around 24-7 for 30 days. That would let you read every thought that went through his mind. That would let you observe the temptations that he has to overcome. His weaknesses. His failures. His shortcomings. When I say he, I'm talking about mankind, he and she. There's not a, there's not a man walking the face of this earth that would let you do that. You won't follow me around. <laughs> I'll tell you now. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, sir. So you're not perfect preacher? No way. But I know a perfect Savior. I know who to run to. I know who to open my heart to. I know who to talk to. I know where to get strength. I know, what it, I know what's necessary. And the one that you have to go to. So when someone walks in this house... And they come in here and they come right off the street. And we had some here Sunday like that, right off the street. He said, what am I going to do with them, preacher? Show them Christian kindness. Show them Christian love. Show them that somebody cares. I was reading a thing the other day about an episode at Sing Sing Prison. Sing Sing. How many have ever heard of Sing Sing? Famous, Sing Sing. A warden took over that prison, and when he took it over, he was appalled at the living condition of the prisoners. It was horrible, horrible beyond belief. These prisoners were murderers, rapists, every kind of thing you could imagine, full of them. This warden's wife took it upon herself to go about changing the conditions of that prison and making it better for the prisoners, improved their food, improved their conditions, improved, you know, the, everything that makes life a little more bearable inside the prison. She even took her children 
After she'd done this, she took her children with her, went inside the prison walls, and would sit there and watch these murderers and rapists play ball and do what they do out in the, in the courtyard. Quite a thing. It wasn't long after that that she got killed in a car wreck. Terrible accident. Young woman got killed. A day or two after this, the prisoners noticed that there was something amiss because they didn't see her. Something was wrong. They didn't see her. So they came to the gate of the prison, these hardened criminals at Sing Sing. They came to that gate, and they asked the warden, where is this lady? He said, I hate to tell you this, but she got killed in a car wreck. And her body is lying right up the street here in a funeral home. Those prisoners said, please, please, let us go. Let us go up there and let us see her one more time. Do you know what that warden did? He said, if you'll promise that you'll come back to this prison, I'll let you go. He opened the prison and these hardened criminals, murderers and rapists, walked out of that prison and walked up to where her body was laying and they stood at her casket and they wept like babies. You know why? She showed them love. And every one of them came back to the prison. Not a single one of them tried to escape. They came back to the prison and all of that was because somebody had loved them. And they were unlovable, but she showed them the love of Christ. That will reach into the heart. Now, I'm not talking about condoning anything. It's the legalist that can only see the letter of the law, but never understand the spirit of the law that will pounce on that. This is not condoning anything anybody does but it is reaching down into their dark world, into their lost world, into their dead world, into their natural world, and showing them the love of Christ. And you'd be surprised at what that'll do. Now you can jump on the elevator and you can say one, two, three, believe after me, and you can get off of the elevator and have six or seven saved people, and you can go around and brag about that all over the countryside, how you're a great soul winner. I signed off of that over 30 years ago. That's garbage. That's garbage. But I do believe that if you're willing to put the effort into it, you can sow some seed, and somebody else can water that seed, and God will give the increase. And then you'll have a real new birth. You'll have somebody really born again. And when that takes place, you'll have something that glorifies God. Because there's nothing in the world, there's nothing in, the, in this world, I think, there's nothing in this world, as far as I'm concerned, that glorifies God anymore than to see somebody who is good for nothing all of a sudden change completely from what they were into a child of God. And the only one that can get glory for that is the Almighty, the new birth. Amen. Now, that's, a, that's quite, a, it's quite a challenge to you because we've got people coming to temple that are visiting with us now. And they're coming from everywhere. And they're coming from every kind of a circumstance you can imagine. And uh, I don't know how to be any plainer than what I am tonight. As far as I'm concerned, they're welcome. Now... If two men come in here and they sit back there in the back and they start kissing each other, they're out the door. Yes. Two women come in and do that, they're out the door. First, number one, they're not going to do it in front of these kids. All right? You don't have to put up with that. In the first place, if they did that, they would be doing that to shame you. They would be doing that to make a statement. They would. Be, they would. They would. They're not interested in hearing the gospel. So you have to use some discernment. But for the most part, for the most part, when somebody comes in the house of God, they're welcome. They're welcome. Don't care where they came from, what they've done, 
The Bible said Christ tasted death for every man. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Did you have something to say, sister? That's what that great white throne's about. Most abortions today are done simply a matter of convenience. That's all. Can you imagine the taking of a human life simply as a matter of convenience. There's a problem, folks. Big problem. Big problem. Yes, sir. Andrew Womack? Yes. Yes, I've seen him on TV. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, sir. I, uh, my doctor called the other day and uh, said, I've, re I've reset your appointment. And I feel bad about it because, uh, you know, she had to go to India. I said, well, I'm not going to go right now. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep praying about this. And uh, a lot of people have told me they've been praying for me. And maybe the good Lord's healed me. And I can always do this later. So I'm going to back off right now and uh, let it go. And so that's what I told her. I told her nurse that called me to tell her, and I'm going to wait. Now, I may wind up in the ER here in a week or two. Who knows? But I'm going to trust God. Amen. That's the number one thing. Yes, sir. Sure. She's a she's a Shemite. She understands English a lot better than I understand Chinese. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That really is. <laughs> Did y'all hear what he said? <laughs> they were <laughs> that little pigtail, the thing you either put it in a cigarette lighter or put it in one tan, yet they had the thing turned around and plugged back into its into its into itself. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? That's sad people get plugged into themselves. I've seen I've seen few times that's happened. Yes, ma'am. All right. 
Yes, ma'am. I pray for Ken every day. Every day I pray for him. All right. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I saw her the other day. She's down in Lenore City in uh, Fort Sanders in Lenore City. She definitely needs prayer. Nancy Martin, Jerry Martin's mother.